third party content has been copied and communicated pursuant to Part 5A or 5B of the Copyright Act, unless indicated otherwise. All right, it's nine o'clock, so we'll uh, make a start. Mai 1940, voyage éclair à Rion et Montagne. J'arrive, écrit Bataille, au jour où les parties lointaines de ma vie se mêlent à ce qui m'est à cœur aujourd'hui. Rien ne m'empêcherait maintenant de frapper du pied la marche d'un hôtel où peut-être je saignerai. Rien en effet ne l'empêchera en septembre-octobre 41 d'écrire un récit fulgurant qui paraîtra sous pseudonyme « Madame Edwarda ».« Madame Edwarda me fascinait, je n'avais jamais vu de fille plus jolie ni plus nue. Sans me quitter des yeux, elle prit dans un tiroir des bas de soie blanche, elle s'assit sur le lit et les passa. Le délire d'être nue la possédait. Cette fois encore, elle écarta ses jambes, ouvrit la fente. » Nous sommes ici au cœur de l'instant bataillien où toutes choses pâlissent devant l'horreur qu'autorise la nuit. On comprend que Bataille, qui écrit le supplice dans la foulée de Madame Edwarda, est tenu à faire remarquer qu'il n'aurait pu écrire le supplice s'il n'en avait d'abord donné la clé lubrique. Et cette clé, c'est Edwarda, nue, tirant la langue au milieu d'une salle bondée d'hommes et de femmes. La voix de Madame Edwarda était obscène. « Tu veux voir mes guenilles » disait-elle. Assise, elle maintenait haute une jambe écartée. Pour mieux ouvrir la fente, elle achevait de tirer la peau des deux mains. Ainsi, les guenilles d'Edwarda me regardaient, velues et roses, pleines de vie comme une pieuvre répugnante. Je balbutiais doucement. « Pourquoi fais-tu cela ?»« Tu vois, » dit-elle, « je suis Dieu. »« Je suis fou. »« Mais non, il faut que tu regardes. »« Regarde. » guys uh, make of that short video? Interpretations? Impressions? Yeah. <laughs> well, last week we opened up with comedy, so I thought uh, we'd do something different, keep it, keep it mixed up. Um, well, since the topic today is sex and morality, as, as uh, the topic is next week, sex and war morality, but there's a different sort of emphasis on, on each uh, week. This week we're sort of halfway caught between uh, sex pleasure and morality, which is Hawani's uh, title of chapter six, and uh, sex prostitution and morality, which I went for because that's the sort of main uh, sort of case study for analysis, the main sexual act that Hawani is going to apply moral theory to, to see whether um, you know, it, it's permissible or not, but he also applies moral theory to arguments against prostitution to show that some of these anti-prostitution arguments aren't really so moral on uh, consequentialist grounds, for instance. Next week will be pornography. So next week will be sex pornography morality because the main object of critical analysis uh, for Hawani in that, in that chapter is the notion of objectification, the notion that objectification uh, is something uh, malevolent, pernicious, uh, reduces people, particularly women, to, to sexual objects and, so in, and in doing so uh, degrades and, and demeans them. So we, those sorts of arguments can be made about prostitution as well, but they're more, I guess, uh, they're more emphasised when it comes to pornography, so we'll, uh, we'll deal with them when we get to that. So, reading from the top. 
This week we examine moral issues raised by sex, in particular prostitution. Is it permissible? If so, in what way? Is it just another sort of work, sex work? All right. uh, if so, why the fuss? So if I'm a mechanic, I'm using my body to fix a car. If I'm a plumber, I'm using my hands, my brain, to fix pipes. As a philosopher, I'm using my brain to read, to analyse, using my body. If I use my body for sex, though, suddenly the moral force comes out to stop it. So why does sex make it different? Because it involves the sexual parts? Because they both use the body. So why the fuss? That's what we're going to look at today. You might decide that the fuss is legitimate, but that's the question we're going to uh, deal with today. As said, we'll track Hawani applying consequentialist, deontological and virtue ethics moral theory to the arguments on various sex, sex acts and sex work waged by various forces and groups. So when we got to the end of the love module and we were introduced to moral theory, uh, the three types, I said this is going to be, well they might seem funny to try and morally justify love, which seems like morality itself to us. These, these theories are going to be useful when we deal with the controversial areas in, in sexuality, namely prostitution this week, pornography, uh, next week. So they're good tools for analysis. Uh, Hawani is the book, uh, chapter 6, but some of the readings he, uh, some of the literature he discusses are also part of the readings. For instance, uh, Russell Benoy, he gets discussed by Hawani in uh, the first section of this chapter. And there's a couple of other readings there as well uh, on Cloud Deacon. Namely, there's one which evaluates prostitution from Marxist, feminist, and liberal slash libertarian uh, perspective. So it'll be interesting to hear what you guys uh, made of that analysis at some point. All right. Last week, just reading from here, we discussed whether some sexual desires are perverted or unnatural. All right. Perverted as in unnatural. We discovered the paradox of it being natural to be perverse relative to certain social, moral, cultural norms the good, because of our polymorphous libidinal nature, the body. So this is sort of what happens after the Freudian experience, I think, and after Nietzsche as well, but more so Freud, where it's like, well, from the perspective of, of the good, of the moral good, nature is perverse. And that's our origins. We are a part of nature. Right? We are, we are in nature, we are of nature, we create a distance from nature to create a moral good, to create a culture. But then we get that paradox where it's natural to be perverse. Perver nature seems perverse relative to the good. So that was last week. We sort of dealt with that uh, issue a bit. You remember that uh, graphic design picture of Freud going polymorphously perverse, making the, the heavy metal sign? That was just a little bit of theatre so you can uh, remember uh, those signifiers as trigger points if you come to write on this stuff later. For instance, from the essays of Mark so far, I noticed a few people went with the jellyfish. So, and it was good, it was really well done. That's why I sort of do a bit of you know, vaudeville sometimes with various aspects of the course, just to act as a kind of mnemonic trigger. And it seemed to have worked a, a couple of times. People had some very interesting things to say via Hawani's um, jellyfish metaphor. All right, now, this idea that nature is perverse we are naturally perverse relative to the moral good, right, is evident when Hawani asks whether some acts are more pleasurable than others. This is where the pleasure bit comes in. Because he says, if we over-internalise taboos, right, prohibitions against nature in the name of the good, we might rob ourselves of doing the things that naturally give us the most pleasure. Right? His example is the repressed homosexual man. So he might be fully gay or he might be... Uh, you know, bi, you know, sort of half gay, half straight, or he might be a bit bi, but he's repressing that because he's internalised the taboos against homosexuality that says, you know, it is wrong to, to do this sort of stuff. And Hawani's saying, well, so he might be trying to have straight sex, right, heterosex, while really he would be enjoying gay sex a hell of a lot more if he just loosened the grip of his taboo. The other example he gives is a, is a woman who sees herself as too dignified and, and, and refined to engage in sort of non-missionary sex. I think he used the example of doggy style, for instance. She might see herself as too dignified and refined to do that, but if she uh, loosens the taboo against this sort of prim and proper behaviour, she might find sex acts that she enjoys a lot more. 
I've uh, paraphrased that in terms of a feminist because he's going to critique a feminist position against prostitution where a feminist might really enjoy taking a passive position relative to the man in, in the sexual act but feel that that's somehow going against equality or sort of selling out the, you know, the woman's movement or something like that. So uh, she might be you know, not getting as much pleasure out of her acts as she might have. And I think there's actually a, a connection there, like the, the man repressing homosexuality in himself and the feminist repressing taking uh, the passive position relative to a man. Both of them are in some ways afraid of the passive position because a man is being a homosexual in some ways he's taking a passive relation to the other man, especially if he's the bottoms as opposed to the tops. So there is a sort of anxiety that people get over feminine jouissance, which is a big issue that Lacan takes up in Seminar 20. Uh, if you guys want to do a bit of extra uh, uh, research into these areas, um, we seem to have developed a big phobia about feminine jouissance. There's something wrong with it. Women uh, feel you know, like they're not allowed to have it. Uh, you know, men don't know what to do with it. And it's part of the whole sort of uh, almost foreclosure of, or, or rejection of, uh, of the feminine position as being somehow negative or wrong or, you know, or bad. It sort of just comes through culture in various ways. The other example he gives is a, you know, a prude trying to be abstinent who thinks you know, the best thing to do is not have sex. But uh, you know, really he'd probably, he or she would probably enjoy that a hell of a lot more than stamp collecting or video games or whatever the substitute activity they frenziedly take to is. All right. That's page 157, as I've got there in the brackets, where Hawaiian discusses that. Uh, all right, mic on full. Now, Hawaiian cites Schopenhauer, the philosopher Schopenhauer, who came uh, before Nietzsche, influenced Nietzsche, uh, around about the same time as, as Darwin, so, or slightly before, um, in the 19th century, mid to early, early to mid 19th century in Germany. Uh, materialist, Hawani cites him to indicate the tempestuous aspect of the sexual drive. Because Schopenhauer is a notorious pessimist about sexuality, right? Which Hawani uses to suggest again the need for moral monitoring. So just as love as a powerful emotion needed moral monitoring to make sure it didn't overwhelm us and undermine us and lead us astray, lead us to act uh, unprudentially or immorally, so obviously the same thing is going to be with sex, right? Which is arguably more harder to control than, than, uh, than love. So he's going to go through and sort of you know, apply consequentialism and other moral theories to various sex acts to show that, yes, they can lead us astray, yes, moral monitoring is good, but it doesn't mean we have to reject it totally because that will do more harm than good. Right? And what he also does, I think, is show that the way we apply moral theory to sec the sex drive can also need monitoring. For example, on the issue of sex work. All right. This is because, reading from the bottom, moralizing itself can be a symptom or expression of sexual repression, return of the repressed. So, what do I mean there? So, instead of acting on my, just say I'm sexually repressed, right? Instead of like loosening the taboo and finding some, some sexual satisfaction for myself, I go around sort of almost like projecting my repression on other people. As soon as I see somebody else having sexual fun, I start calling them a sinner, I tell them they're going to go to hell, I tell them they should be banned, you know, I, I have to find a sin somewhere, I'm like a kind of you know, caricature from the, from, the, from the Christian era or something, like a, like a nun or a, or a church father, you know, there's sin everywhere. And you see some fundamentalist priests will get up there and sort of carry on in the same way today, but it looks a little bit uh, anachronistic, but you sort of, even in some sort of ideology as you see sometimes they take a really moralistic stance about sexual expression and sexual freedom. And, you know, the reason I played the Bill Hicks sort of uh, click last week is to, so we can sort of just step back from that and say, you know, when did sex become a bad thing? You know, did I miss a meeting? You know, you know, sorry, Bill, you were asleep. There was a big vote. Sex is out. You know, can I still vote? So it's, it's just this assumption that sex is still bad, this sex negative kind of mentality that just creeps in. And usually it's people just trying to deny their own sexuality, acting it out on you. That's sort of a kind of psychoanalytic reading, especially aggressive moralizing, demanding the impossible, protesting too much. Because remember Hawani said an ought should imply a can. We should not demand the impossible of people. Like I've given the example in the notes down the bottom here. I can't order you morally to flap your wings, flap your arms like wings and fly, and call you immoral for not doing that. 
you know why? Because it's impossible. So I shouldn't demand something of you that's impossible. If I say you ought to do something, it ought to, ought to be possible that you can do it. So trying to prohibit sexual, various forms of sexual expression is wrong morally because it is not possible for the majority of people to completely prohibit most of their sexual expression. So that's what, what I'm saying there. On the left here, does anyone recognize that uh, sculpture? Anyone doing art history or classical studies? Uh, it's, uh, it's a sculpture of um, Aphrodite, Aphrodite of Knidos by Praxiteles, who's one of the best uh, sculptors of the classical world. And Phryne, uh, the courtesan, is said to be the model. That's the sort of uh, story we get. And the reason I played that Bataille uh, clip, as sort of uh, shocking as it might seem, is because Bataille is somebody who's trying to regain an ancient sense of the sacred, the older sense of the religion, through, through, sex, through the sex worker, through the prostitute. So that little clip from that uh, story was about Madame Edwarda, by being a madame, I, I suppose she was either a prostitute or a, a owner of a brothel. And you see sort of Bataille's fascination with the female genitalia. And instead of a jellyfish, he sees a squid. So maybe like that's what Hawani's jellyfish meant. Maybe it was a, it was a signifier for the, for, the, for the female genitalia in some way that he avoids by being a homosexual man. He's not going to get caught up in the monogamous sort of relations that heteronormativity sometimes applies. Although some... Uh, uh, gays and lesbians are really into like family and, and stuff like that. Hawani doesn't seem to be that type of, of guy and that's not sort of the people he quotes too much. So, but but Bataille was really interesting in that he's looking for this older sense of the sacred. Uh, he was he, at one stage training to be a Catholic priest and he says, Nietzsche saved me from Catholicism. And he was quoted afterwards saying that uh, the brothels of Paris thereby became his, his churches. So he'd frequent these brothels of Paris and he'd look for a sense of the sacred in this sort of sublime feminine object, this sublime object of feminine jouissance. And if you read his uh, erotic novels, there's often like a, uh, like a protagonist like Madame Edwarda who's really inciting these like uh, transgressive sexual acts and another woman who's more sort of, uh, sort of frigid and withdrawn. And there's usually that sort of duality working in his work. Maybe not quite the, the Madonna whore thing because for him... The Madonna is the sort of uh, is is the whore, anyway. If you're going to use that sort of binary that comes down from from Christianity, but he, and you know, I don't like words like whore and stuff like that. But he, he will keep those pejorative terms as well. Like he, he used words like slit and uh, probably some other stuff that was even worse. Uh, he, you know, if he was English, he'd probably use the c word because he thinks that these words that are used to denigrate the sexual parts uh, give those sexual parts a forbidden fruit value. They open up that barrier such that crossing it creates the ultimate sort of uh, enjoyment, uh, the joy of uh, transgression, the joy of breaking rules. So he's a very interesting uh, uh, character in that way. I mentioned him last week with respect to uh, eroticism and the relation between taboo and transgression. He's criticised for keeping some of those negative words as well, but um, he has a sort of story to tell about them. All right, now let's look at Schopenhauer. Is he being just a realist or is he being a pessimist? And Hawani quotes most of his paragraph at length. The sexual impulse in all its degrees and nuances plays not only on the stage and in novels, but also in the real world, where, next to the love of life, it shows itself the strongest and most powerful of motives, and it constantly lays claim to half the powers and thoughts of the young. So you can see how he's almost proto-Freudian in the way he sort of really sees sexual activity being displaced into other activities, even while we're trying to deny it. We sort of overinvest other things. Sexuality is still uh, pumping through somehow. It is the ultimate goal of almost all human effort. So that's that sort of a line again, that pansexualist line. It interrupts the most serious occupations every hour and sometimes embarrasses for a while even the greatest minds, even philosophers, in other words. It does not hesitate to intrude with its trash, interfering with ne the negotiations of statesmen and investigations of the learned. So when he keeps words like trash, he's not doing it like Bataille because he thinks he's going to add erotic value to... Uh, the sex act, he's doing it because he wants to dismiss it totally and reject it from his life, you know, take out the trash. It's sort of a different, different story to Bataille. 
But Ty's trying to reclaim these words in the way that, you know, not quite the same way as you get queer theorists. Queer used to be a pejorative term. Now it's like, you know, we're here, we're queer, you know, hallelujah sort of thing. But in a different way, he says, like, yeah, yeah, you know, call it bad names. That way I can feel like I get a bit of a rebellious tinge as I go for it. So you're just serving my, uh, my purposes, my attempt to recover the older sense of the sacred through this Christian or Christocentric epoch that I'm trapped in. It knows, talking about love, how to slip its love letters and ringlets even into ministerial portfolios and philosophical manuscripts. And no less devises daily the most entangled and the worst actions, destroying the most valuable relationships, breaking the firmest bonds. So this idea that sex knows how to slip its love letters and ringlets even into philosophical manuscripts, including the aggressive moralists who protest too much when they say, let's ban porn, let's ban short skirts, let's ban, uh, you know, whatever. It's like... You know, is it because they really want to take out the trash or it's because that's the only way they can, that's how their sexuality shows itself to them as a symptom? It demands a sacrifice of life, of health, wealth, rank and happiness. Nay, it robs those who are otherwise honest of all conscience, makes those who have a third toe being faithful traitors. Accordingly on the whole, so he's summing up, overall, sex, it appears as a malevolent demon that strives to pervert, confuse, and overthrow everything. So uh, that's pretty sex negative, right? There's no kind of, you know, hooray, how much fun are we going to have like, later? It's just like, don't go there. So what's Nietzsche say? Because Nietzsche actually turned from, Nietzsche was a, a professor of classics, right, at the University of Basel. He discovered Schopenhauer, then switched to philosophy. Uh, he was really moved by Schopenhauer in his early kind of uh, in his early stages, but then rejected him emphatically, and then rejected Wagner too because Wagner and his crew stayed with Schopenhauer. Wagner, the, the great composer, Nietzsche says, reading from here, Schopenhauer is still too sex negative, right? He's strong enough to overcome hitherto Christian metaphysics because Schopenhauer was one of the first uh, like strong atheist voices in in uh, the German tradition. Uh, Sort of, you know, then the, later on there's Marx, or Marx comes slightly later, and Darwin's theory of evolution comes out about all around the sort of uh, 1840s, 1850s. So Schopenhauer was the first to just say, well, look, let's just abandon this castle in the sky, right? There's no evidence for it. Science has returned. You know, it's another s uh, bit of trash we can take out. Nietzsche's saying, okay, he's strong enough to do that, but he doesn't overcome the negative evaluations of the earthly bodily realm that Christian metaphysics enshrines and holds in place. So why is, the, why is sex negative? Why is the earthly bodily realm negative? Because they've got somewhere better from which to judge it. This heaven that we go to after we die. Right? If we don't have that bandage point up in the sky, why should we call this negative in comparison? There's no point to make that comparison. That castle in the sky is a Puritan fantasy. That's what Nietzsche's argument is. So you abandon the castle in the sky, you abandon the negative valuations of the earthly realm. It, it caused, you can't sit on the top of the ladder and diss the bottom of the ladder because if you come from the bottom of the ladder, Actually, you're standing on the bottom of a ladder without realising it. That's where your feet are always planted. Right? But for Schopenhauer, if there's no wise, benevolent creator at the centre of the cosmos, no God, an intelligent design sort of view, then the cosmos must be a dumb and stupid place. So Schopenhauer is keeping this negative valuation of the earth that the Christian sort of and the Platonists develop. Right? And for Nietzsche, he sounds abandoned, disappointed, disillusioned. So what does Schopenhauer do? He turns to the east. He turns to buddhistic sort of ascetic practices to try and meditate and, and try and escape desire. He thinks desire is something that's going to always lead you astray, as you can tell by his view on sex. He felt his own desire like a cross to bear. He got off on denigrating it, that's what Nietzsche says, right? Look how poetic he gets when he's picking on sex. That's, that's his sex. That's how he has sex, by bagging sex. He just, he's just really getting off on it. You can hear his response. You know, it's his own sexuality that's slipping its love letters and ringlets in between his condemnations of sex. It's the only outlet he's got for it. That's what Nietzsche's sort of saying. And he also denigrates woman, women, Schopenhauer, as the main object cause of such desire for him, because he's a famous... Uh, his views are known as quite uh, misogynist. He seems to be really negative about uh, women. Nietzsche does too, at, at first approximation, and sometimes he probably falls into that trap, but I think Nietzsche offers a way out as well of negative evaluations of, of femininity. Um, but Schopenhauer, although some people still find it interesting because he sort of seems to anticipate evolutionary biology with his views of sexual difference, 
generally people find him uh, uh, too negative uh, against women, just like the Christians and just like the Platonists. And Aristotle, you know, women are at the bottom of the ladder because they've got the body, because they're connected to the body where the womb is and where babies come from, stuff like that. Now, what's Hawani going to say? To be fair, when we're evaluating something, to be fair, we have to take note of all the good consequences too. If we're evaluating sex, we've got to look at the good consequences of sex too. So, Schopenhauer can't sit there and say, accordingly on the whole, on balance, and then just mention all the potentially negative things. That's not, that's not taking a net balance. That's just you know, only fixating on the negative side of the equation. So that's what Hawani is sort of doing when he sort of brings out consequentialism. He also quotes um, his teacher Sobel, paraphrasing Kant, saying something equally negative about sex, like it leads us to back way, back way, back, back alleyway, microbial like, gropings and stuff like that. But we're going to discuss Kant next week because the theory of negative objectification comes from Kant. So I'll leave Kant aside for next week and find another like, nice picture as well to keep you exciting. Okay, keep you excited. <laughs> exciting. So, Hawani on prostitution, right? Just like when it comes to sexuality, he says we've got to be fair when it comes to prostitution. We can't just look at the negative uh, aspects of it, the negative consequences of it, or the potentially negative consequences of it, so as to dismiss it. We've got to look at also the potentially positive consequences of it. We also have to have a decent explanation of any negative consequences. Like he uses the example of um, homosexuality in a homophobic world, right? Uh, our, our world's not so homophobic anymore, not to the extent it used to be, but what if the thought of like homosexuals doing a homosexual thing drives the whole town, the whole city into hysteria so that they're rioting and smashing shit on the streets? You can't come along and say from consequentialist grounds, uh, well, we should ban homosexuality. Look, it leads to chaos. It, it upsets people. Because Hawaiian is going to say, yeah, but that's because those people are idiots. You know, the problem is not homosexuality. The problem is the bigots. Attack the attitude if the attitude is wrong. So he's going to do something a little bit similar on prostitution. He's not going to be as strong against it as he was against uh, homophobia. But he's going to do something a little bit similar on prostitution and say, we've got to look at the consequences fairly. We've got to do our homework and do it objectively. In the, uh, in the Stan and Tim audio for this week, which I listened to yesterday, sort of Stan said, yeah, yeah, we've got to like, you know, do, our, do our sociology. And I'll, I'll, I'll almost like dispute that and say sociology is precisely what we don't do. Because the problem with sociologists is that they tend to come often out of this Rousseauian enlightenment tradition and don't think that we have a human nature that is naturally animal and perverse. So anything that seems to be exhibiting animalistic behaviour, they think it's just a product of society or culture or, or media or bad people and we should try and prohibit it totally. Because they don't start off from that polymorphously perverse base. They don't start off from nature before it was distorted by various metaphysical traditions. So be careful of sociologists. There's a couple of articles from sociologists in the, in the readings, one for prostitution and one for pornography. Just be careful of their starting point and say, what notion of nature are they working with? Are they working with this sort of like, uh, you know, our inner essence is Jesus, and once we get rid of the bad Satan, we're all going to be like little Care Bears, you know? I love you, Care Bear. You know, if that's what they're doing, then, you know, grow up. We've had Darwin now, we've returned, we've had the Renaissance, we've had the scientific revolution, and we know that's a bit of a faulty premise. Faulty premises lead to faulty conclusions. So, Hawaiian is going to tackle the anti-prostitution views of the feminist Laurie Schraig. I think she might be a sociologist or a, some kind of philosopher in the west coast of America, I think. Uh, I looked her up last year when I first came across her. But Schraig suggests that even if prostitutes and their clients are able to practice safe sex in a well-regulated setting, right, it still leads to the entrenching of sex, sexism and marginalisation of women. Right? Ooh, that's a big claim. Hawani says, if this is so, if Schrag is right, prostitution should be dismissed and condemned on consequentialist grounds. But is it so? Is it true that prostitution leads to the entrenching of sexism and the marginalisation of all women? Now, Schrag thinks there are four false beliefs behind prostitution, prostitution which lowers the status of all women. Belief one, that there is a universally powerful sex drive, especially in men. 
You might just say, is it belief? Is belief the right word there? Well, she uses belief, right? Belief two, that men are naturally more dominant. Belief three, that sex pollutes women. Belief four, that a sexuality defines us. I think one and two would be different to three and four. When it comes to three and four, just like his, his response to the sort of uh, people misusing consequentialism to dismiss homosexuality, is going to say, look, those attitudes are wrong. We can attack them, all right? If, if we think that sex pollutes women and therefore we should ban prostitution because given that they have so much sex, people are going to dismiss them, is it prostitution's fault or the sex negative attitude's fault? You know, if, if we don't think sex is bad, then we shouldn't dismiss prostitution because some people are going to think that about prostitutes and make their life horrible. We should attack that silly attitude, that sex negative attitude, that leads to that denigration. All right? Same with the idea that sexuality defines us. Part four, the idea that, you know, you're gay, you're straight, you're bi, you're this, you're that. Like, really? Like, is, is, is that my whole identity? Is that your whole identity? What you do with your naughty bits in your own you know, spare time? Obviously, there's more to an identity. So, Schrag is worried that because people think a sexuality defines people, prostitution's bad because we're always going to dismiss them as mere prostitutes, mere whores or whatever, right? And everyone is going to say, it's not prostitution's fault, it's the sex negative attitude's fault. It's, it's this idea that sexuality defines us, but it doesn't. That's just, you know, that's just what they do. That's just their job. It's the attitude that's the problem. That's what he's going to say there in three and four. So if you're worried about the attitude, don't contribute to it. That's what Hawaiian is going to say. If you're worried that prostitutes are going to be denigrated because of what they do, right, don't contribute to that denigration by denigrating them for what they do. That's what he does in point three or four. Now, point one and two, right, point one and two, reading from the right-hand column. The belief in a universal powerful sex drive, especially in men, it really needs to factor in our biology, right? It's pretty hard. I think it's a bit of a stretch to call that a, you know, a mere belief. A strong sex drive surely is a fact. It's just a fact about the animal, the animal world. Right? It comes up in psychoanalysis, it comes up in sexology, it comes up in biology, it comes up in popular culture. You know, it's, that's why I played that Bill Hicks thing again where it's like, oh no, pornography causes sexual thoughts. Madonna videos cause sexual thoughts. And you know, when Bill Hicks said, I'll tell you what causes sexual thoughts. Having genitals. All right? That's why I played that for. It's just to not get caught into these traps to thinking that, you know, Strong sex drive is a social construct, as if the whole of nature itself is just a social construct. No, it's, it's where we come from, where we are, have a look around. Right? And the way Shrey tries to defend this position that strong sex drive is just a fact, it's just a belief, not a fact, is by citing a case of postnatal abstinence in a New Guinea tribe. And it's just really not enough to, like, to challenge the view of a strong sex drive. It's, actually, it's, it's really revealing how poor this attempt at arguing is. It's, um, uh, as Hawani says, like citing one tribe like that is not enough. We need additional examples of people who don't experience the sex, strong sex drive as Westerners supposedly do because of the media or whatever, right? The, this tribe could have a powerful sex drive, but for cultural and other reasons, control or oppress it better. They could be masturbating, they could be doing other things, and they could, like, um, you know, they, they could be displaced in other directions. Like, the, the, the example is not exhaustive, and apparently, Schrag sort of admits this later on. Uh, so why say it in the first place? Right? But for Hawani, right, increasingly pop culture is showing women to have a strong sex drive too. So that's his notion of equality. It's not like women are being seduced by the evil patriarchy or capitalism to be sex, sexed creatures again. It's their own sexuality is more and more coming to the surface as we distance ourselves further and further from uh, Christian Platonist morality. So that's Hawani's notion of equality. We are both sexed, equally sexed beings. It shows itself in different ways, but equally strong. Maybe he's not quite right there. Maybe the differences are more than he wants to admit. But I think he sort of has a point as well. Point two, right? The belief that men are naturally more dominant. This needs to factor in anatomical differences between the sexes, right? Testosterone, when you go through, when men go through puberty, the different size in musculature. I put bone density there because um, like I was listening to an interview of that uh, Ronda Rousey, the, uh, the female UFC champion who uh, recently uh, won the title. It was the first time uh, 
uh, women were allowed to compete in the UFC. That's that um, octagon cage fighting, mixed martial arts, where you can do jiu-jitsu, karate, elbows, wrestle on the ground. It looks, it's pretty brutal, but it's a pretty, pretty tough sport, the toughest you probably can get. And she was asked the question of like, intersex people, like women who, who uh, men who think they're women, who want to compete as women in this, in, this, in this octagon, who've gone through hormone changes and uh, some surgery, to, and who now think they're women, though the old case of the, you know, the woman trapped in a man's body. And now they want to compete in, in the octagon. And, she's, and she, she was asked that, and she said, look, um, I don't want to like, say too much beyond my level of expertise. I know that in their minds they're, they're women, and, and that's fine. And I know there's hormone suppression or replacement therapy and, and uh, surgery you can do to make the changes. But she goes, the technology isn't like perfect. And if they've gone through puberty as a boy, they're going to have an advantage over women in the octagon. She said it comes down to things like bone density. Like if they throw a kick and I sort of check the kick and that's how they do it, she goes like, I'm not really checking the kick if they've got extra bone density. What I'm doing is just like designating the spot where their leg's going to come in and crack mine because there's not a, a stronger bone in there. So there are like, you know, musculature, musculature differences, right, which explain why men have, uh, you know, a, a, a attained a position of, of dominance over time in their own way in terms of like muscular strength. And this had an incredible, like, what about incredible uh, evolutionary advantage over the course of our our trajectory going back to the prehistoric uh, ages. You know, you've got to defend your land, you've got to defend your house, you've got to defend your walls, you've got to defend your kids, and you, know, you need the men to know how to use weapons, know how to be tough, know how to be fit. Um, you know, to cover over that difference just seems like a bit of a, uh, some kind of detachment, detachment from physical, biological reality. And it's not that there aren't exceptions, right? Ronda Rousey would probably kick the shit out of me, break my arm in half in about three seconds. But I don't think she's going to be ignorant enough to pretend that she can therefore beat you know, the heavyweight male champion, something like that. It, would, it wouldn't even get me in the ring for like a billion dollars because he's about 50 k's 50 heavier than me. So just about sort of being honest about what biology is and how it's delivered certain differences. And Schrag doesn't seem to want to do that. There are exceptions, but not enough to refute the general claim. Now, Hawani also considers other consequentialist arguments against sex work, like the spread of STDs, stuff like that, right? He's going to counter these by saying, look, it's the criminalization of sex work that leads to such problems, right? It pushes it underground where we can't control how often people are getting tested or who's, like, running the brothel, who's the madame. If we legalize it, we can regulate it better. That's Hawani's approach, right? That leads to better consequences. Uh, Schrag knows pro prohibiting uh, prostitution will lead to worse consequences, so she wants to deter it through regulation. If you look at what sex workers themselves say, like if you go to the Scarlet Alliance, who are connected to the Australian Sex Party, uh, they're really against pro prohibition. What they want is to be able to adv advocate for themselves, like ordinary workers, to make sure they have good working conditions. So that's that. All right? We have to be honest and document good consequences as well. Pleasure and release for clients, income for the worker, probably some pleasure too. We can't sort of just assume that uh, women don't have a positive current to uh, having uh, you know, sexual acts and uh, you know, really erotic sexual acts. Now, another way we can deal with this problem is restore a bit of historical sense. This is from the Melbourne School of Continental Philosophy, which has lectures uh, going during the winter. It's uh, mainly during one week, so it's a between-semester deal, right? This is the one on Heidegger. They're bringing out a guy from all the way from California, and they're very uh, uh, impressed to have him. And in Lecture 2 on Heidegger, he's talking about the history of being and Heidegger's will to, to destroy or deconstruct the history of metaphysics, the history of ontology. One of his main themes is the hidden history of the West. We think we understand history, but we kind of represent it so, such that we occlude it. Western civilization is a succession of metaphysical epochs marked by distinct understandings of being. The ancient Greeks, medieval Christians, early modern subjects, and contemporary technologized consumers, which we generally are, inhabit different and incompatible worlds, each with its own characteristic style and way of organizing existence. Way of organizing existence. Now, by going through these epochs, right, the Greek, the Christian, and the modern, we get a sense of, a different sense of human nature. 
but we've got to understand that we can't just take the, 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 the values of, say, the Christian epoch to evaluate the values of the Greek epoch or you know, the values of the modern epoch to evaluate the, the values of the, the Greek epoch and think we're understanding the values of the Greek epoch. Those values might be different. We've got to try to see them in their own terms and see that the lenses, the frameworks which, through which we evaluate, are themselves, are themselves historically contingent in some way. All right? If they're coloured in red, I'll see everything in, as in red. If they're coloured in green, I see everything in green. So we've got to like, be careful of the way we view phenomena. Don't just like, apply a framework, today Marxism, tomorrow feminism, next day liberalism. Ask, where do these frameworks come from? What's the historical origins? What does that tell us about these frameworks? What are their strengths? What are they missing? That's what Heidegger is trying to do. And he's trying to get, get us beyond metaphysics. He's trying to get us beyond this idea that the Ottomans ladder can be just cut in half and we can just live at the, up the top like a castle in the sky. So it's similar to Nietzsche in some ways, similar to Ricoeur in some ways as well. So let's take a historical sense on sex work, all right? Now, Schrag does this a little bit, Schrager or Schrag. She mentions sex work in other cultures and the ancient world. I think she mentions Babylon. She mentions, I think, provincial France. She doesn't mention ancient Greece, but I think it's worth having a look at it because that's the origin of... Occidental thinking, as Heidegger calls it. Occidental as in Western thinking as opposed to uh, Oriental thinking. Right? How did the Greeks relate to prostitution? Did they want to ban it? Did they think it was evil, a sin, uh, you know, a degradation of, of humanity, particular women? No. Prostitution was common. It employed significant numbers, a notable part of the economic activity, far from being clandestine. Cities did not condemn brothels but rather instituted regulations which is one of the sort of strong currents today. Don't try and criminalise it, just try and have it properly regulated, right? And that's what the uh, ancient Greeks did. The legendary lawmaker Solon in Athens, who's mentioned in the symposium as an example of top of ladder stuff, because it abstracts the higher beauties, the beauty of a, like, a well-functioning legal system. Solon is credited with having instituted legal brothels with regulated prices, around 594 BC. Right? the start of the golden age, which went for about 200 years. He did this as a public health measure to contain adultery. So you know the difference in values, right? If, if you're married and you have sex with a prostitute, it's not adultery. If you have sex with another free woman, that's adultery. And if you get caught, if the husband of that free woman or the father of that free woman catches you, then she has the legal right to, to strike you dead on the spot. So that was the big, that was the big crime for them. Prostitution, however, involved both sexes, but differently, right? Women of all ages, so you can have older women being prostitutes, which is interesting. The men were generally young who were prostitutes for a predominantly male clientele. There are, there are some stories about females using it, but it's predominantly male clientele. Philemon, ancient source. Solon, seeing Athens full of young men with both an instinctual compulsion, i.e. Eh, realising that sexual thoughts are not caused by uh, Madonna videos, it's caused by having genitals, right? Instinctual compulsion and a habit of straying in an inappropriate direction brought women, or bought women and established them in various places equipped and common to all. That might grade us the idea of buying women, but remember slavery was a part of the ancient world. Men and women could be slaves. And one of the tasks they could have as slaves was sex work. Pseudo Demosthenes, another ancient source. We have courtesans for pleasure, concubines to provide for our daily needs, and spouses to give us legitimate children and be faithful guardians of our homes. So, if you were a free woman, your sexuality was probably mostly like taken up by being the wife of the husband, raising the kids. But there were laws which said that if the male, if the husband, wasn't having sex with his with his wife a certain amount of times a month, four, you know, two to four times a month, whatever, he would be like uh, culturally frowned upon. If he had kids with somebody who wasn't his wife and then tried to raise them as legitimate citizens, the wife had power to put a stop to that, as the story of Medea shows. Solon's brothels provided a service affordable to all. So it wasn't just for the rich. Like, from a public servant's wage, you can afford it too, right? And he used the brothel taxes to build a temple to Aphrodite Pandemos, Aphrodite of all the people. So you see, there's, a, there's actually a god for sexual pleasure, a, go a goddess for feminine jouissance. So you see that's what Bataille is kind of 
looking for in the red light districts of, of you know, 1940s, 1950s France, he's, he's looking for Aphrodite, whether he knows it or not. Um, but back in ancient Greece, she didn't have to look for it. Uh, she was there. She was a legitimate goddess. She was one of the twelve. Uh, you know, knock her at your own peril. Right? Athens considered prostitution part of its democracy. So it's very different. Now, there were three classes of uh, sex workers. Because one of the things you can then ask is, like, you know, what, what was life for them? Or was it just hell? Were they just you know, living in absolute misery? Well, let's have, a, let's have a look. There were three classes. The class in the lower rung, the, uh, the porne, that's where we get the modern word porn from. Right? They were actually uh, the properties of pimps, which is the English translation of bottom of voskos, uh, he who owns, or he or she who owns the, uh, the uh, sex worker, who will receive a portion of the earnings. They don't get it all, so they get a portion of the earnings. The owner could be a citizen, that's not considered a shameful occupation considered a source of income like any other. The owner could be male or female. Uh, metic, metic just means a resident foreigner. So you might be living in Athens, but you're originally from the Ionian coast or something like that. Greek, but not from Athens, if you're a metic there. Um, but they were generally of a barbarian origin, which means they were non-Greek, these slaves. So if you went to war, you won. Uh, the, uh, the result of that sort of activity was usually the wholesale slaughter of lots of men, and usually the women and children were uh, sold into slavery in some ways, which doesn't mean they just sit there and get completely uh, whipped you know, till they're dead. They can still earn a portion of their money and sometimes buy their freedom back. But uh, generally, that one of the things they could be uh, sold into doing would be sex work. So that might not sit with us too well, but depends what you think of human nature. Um, uh, citizen girls who had their citizen fathers uh, who had been abandoned by the fathers could be also do this job. Right? Usually employed in brothels and red light districts uh, like Port Piraeus in Athens. Then there's one rung up, which is the independent prostitutes. They could directly display their charms to prostitute clients. They were in public. They walked around with sandals saying, follow me, so that people could like see the imprint and then follow them. They wore their makeup outrageously, apparently. They had various origins. They could be metic women, resident foreigners who couldn't find other work, so could, that could be their source of income. Poor widows, older poor nay who had bought back their freedom, so you could buy your way out of slavery, just like today you could one day pay off your mortgage and finally own your own home, rather than being in a renter's trap like I am today. Um, you know, in Athens, they were registered and tax-paying. They made decent fortunes and were well, sometimes musicians and dancers for, to work at banquets. The heteroi, however, were at the top of the rung, right? Because they did not restrict themselves to sexual services, a bit like the geishas in Japan. Meticulous education enabled them to converse with cultivated men, uh, the independent, managing their own affairs. Aspasia, mistress of Pericles, is the most celebrated woman of the 5th century BC. She was a courtesan, a heteroi, which just means companion or courtesan. She attracted Sophocles, the poet, Phidias, the sculptor, who uh, made the uh, Acropolis, all the sculptures on that. Socrates, the philosopher. Some speculate that she's the real Diotima, because Diotima is a made-up person in the symposium. Maybe it was really Aspasia. And, you know, the, the sexual part of what they did was not rejected. It was just part of a unity, because they'd reached the top of the ladder. They could also be philosophers, especially Aspasia, who was from Miletus, which is where philosophy was uh, uh, pretty much invented, along with, um, with uh, Western science. Uh, coast of modern-day uh, uh, Turkey, Asia Minor, right? We're all sort of like uh, some of the big original Greek cities were. This is just some, uh, some classical representations of uh, Phryne, who's in that statue we looked at before. Um, there was a famous scene where she was taken to court for some reason and she bared her breasts and the, uh, and the judges decided that they could not uh, condemn to death um, yeah, a, pro a prophetess and priestess of Aphrodite, who had the gifts of Aphrodite to such an extent. Completely different representations on both sides. On, on the left, it's kind of like, you know, almost check these out, fellas. Yeah, fantastic, right? On the other side, it's different. It's like, behold, and she's a bit embarrassed, and the guys are just like, oh, man, like, you know, before that sublime image of, 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 of feminine beauty, it's almost like blinding us. Uh, like Bataille and Madame Edwara, when she's saying, look, look, God damn it, you know, look, I'm God, I'm nuts. You know, there's a sort of, almost like a distorted sort of return of Aphrodite in that. 
in that kind of uh, erotic novel. Here's just a representation of uh, Aspasia and Pericles looking at a statue of Athena while Phidias was uh, putting it together. Um, so you can see what kind of esteem uh, a courtesan could be held. It's like it's opposite to the denigration of, of the prostitute that we see today. She provides sex services, but because of her mind, she's seen as independent at the top, cavorts with the best men, and is completely independent and probably very, very wealthy. Same with Finney. Um, now, Hawani finishes by going to virtue ethics again, right? This could all be a bit heady, a bit too confused. He's going to say, just remember moderation when it comes to these acts. Moderation, nothing in excess. When it comes to the wrong things, don't do them at all, right? That's what he's going to say. Michel Foucault here, his book on the right, it's a great uh, uh, example, a great analysis of, uh, of virtue ethics when it comes to sexuality, how the Greeks did it and how we can look at it today. Universality or equality was not really part of the story. That's, what, that's one of the things to sort of consider. There were rules, but that opened up the arena for which different types of people could act in appropriate ways according to their rank and status. Now, next week, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at the issue of uh, objectification in pornography, and we're going to be able to like, flesh out some of these critiques of uh, how sex-negative attitude can lead to moralistic appraisals of various sex acts a little bit more. So bear with me. Cheers. Stop.